Other things. Yeah, yeah, first let's talk about the very big news about the future of Glorantha, which is as of Monday, uh, ownership of all of the intellectual property of Glorantha, RuneQuest, and, and a variety of related properties. Greg transferred not just the license did to us, but transferred ownership of all of that to New Design. So Glorantha is, you know, will continue to be actively produced, actively published. Um, uh, Do you want that on? You can turn it off if you don't need it I'll on. I'll turn it off. Should we, yeah, let's uh, kill the top. Then you can even sit closer together and so the book ends if you want. I mean, it's exciting news because it, it, it makes it a lot easier for us to know that we will be continuing. Just shut your laptop, Jeff. That'll do it, too. And that would work, wouldn't it? That we will continue to be publishing material um, forever. forever. <laughs> and Greg is really excited about that because it's been really important for Greg to have uh, you know, Glorantha continue to be published and, and continue to be explored, but with people that he that that you know he trusts their ability to be good stewards of that intellectual property to handle it with artistic integrity and as well as to keep true and keep faith with his vision of what his creation is. And so we're, we are super stoked and super excited about that. And for us, that's just fantastic news. And as a result now, uh, Lawrence Whitaker is the licensee um, for RuneQuest uh, under license agreement. It's exactly the same as it was under Greg, except it's just now Moon Design Publications rather than this was It's just all. And the same thing with David, uh, David Dunham and A Sharp with uh, King and Dragon Pass. He will continue. I mean, he will continue uh, keeping the King and Dragon Pass iPod, uh, sorry, iPad, uh, iPhone application, uh, and I, I think he's just been doing a few new scenes for it. Yeah, he's done some more updates recently. And uh, you know, again, that's going to continue under the same terms. The main difference is now with the license from us instead of the license from Greg. So, the, you know, from the ultimate customers, the main big deal is, is you will continue to be, you know, having publications exploring Glorantha for ever. As long as we can do it. As long as <laughs> and then we have some other group of people to hand it to. It's exactly. Exactly. So, anyways, we're very excited about that, and and the future of Glorantha is is secure, safe, and um, hasn't looked this good in a very, very long time. Uh, and we've got two big pro. I mean, the guide to Glorantha, which we've been talking about for the last nearly two hours, uh, is obviously the next big Glorantha publication. But we have um, some other pretty big developments up uh, on the horizon after that. Why don't you talk about it? Yeah, the, the big book for RuneQuest will be RuneQuest Adventures in Glorantha. And uh, observant amongst you will know that I've liberally stolen that title from the, the never published RuneQuest 4 draft, which was called RuneQuest Adventures in Glorantha. It was meant to come out after the Avalon Hill, but I thought it was a great title, it, it fits. Uh, fits perfectly and the, the whole idea behind that book is to give players of RuneQuest 6th edition all the tools that they need in one volume to be able to use RuneQuest in Glorantha in the third age. Everyone keeps saying is this second age because I did a lot of work on the second age. No, this is third age. Um, but also using all the canonical stuff that's, that's going to be in the guide. Now this is not going to be you know, yet another introduction to Glorantha. This is not going to be another book that tells you the history of the place and describes everything that, that's been done several times before. That's why we have the guide. This will be the toolkit for you to take the RuneQuest rules and use them to create your characters, whether it's a, 
a satirite, whether it's a Luna, whether it's a, a Pavel Patelen, whether it's someone from Moscow, anywhere they go around, all the major cultures will be dealt with. Well, the eight major. The eight major cultures, and, and some of the, 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 the races as well. Um, and we'll, we'll cover those too. But it will give you everything that you need to, to create your request character to adventure in Glorantha. And that doesn't mean that we're not, I mean, internally, HeroQuest is, is, the, is Moon Design's system. That's but right. basically this gives an option. If you prefer uh, RuneQuest as your rules engine, you can, we're going to make it very easy for you to use RuneQuest as your rules engine. If you prefer HeroQuest as your rules engine, we, we will make it very easy to use HeroQuest. Israel engine, and then the big books like the guide, and the other one we'll talk about, uh, are our systems. So we've got the adventures in Glorantha. That will be the, the the foundation toolkit for RuneQuest Six with Glorantha, and we are then going to follow this up. This is a Gen Con announcement. This is one of our design mechanisms annou announcements for uh, for Gen Con. Um, Michael O'Brien, who wrote Some County uh, for RuneQuest 3, the Avalon Hill edition, is back on board with us. He's a great fan of RuneQuest, great fan of what Pete and I have been doing. And he's going to rewrite Some County, he's going to expand it, and that will be our first campaign book for RQ6 Adventures in Atlanta. So there'll be all new adventures in there, updated material, there's a lot that he wants to redo, uh, so we'll have a brand new version of Some County. And following on from that, we're talking about revisiting Borderlands, you know, the classic boxed campaign set. You know, Mob would love to go and retackle a lot of what was in there. Again, expand it, rewrite some of it, and uh, bring it fully up to date. So there's a, there's a lot that's going to be happening. And uh, we've then got plans to look at Griffin Mountain again, and maybe some other areas too. But they're down, they're down the line. We've, we've got an immediate pipeline that we need to. On the, the HeroQuest side, after the guide, uh, two books that are in the pipeline and basically have been re uh, ready for the art commissioning, but that the guide pushed everything else off because you know, it is the guide, it is the Kickstarter pro uh, project that got uh, gets priority. Ian Storm or Ian Cooper's uh, The Coming Storm, which is a Sarger campaign that goes from 1628 to 1625. In Sartar, uh, that's ready for our commission. Once I'm out of, you know, once my role in putting the guide has been passed safely over to Rick, and uh, then the vestuary, which is by, which is a completely systemless Glorantin vestuary with an un with two unreliable narrators. <laughs> uh, who are Pete Nash and Sandy Peterson uh, are doing it, and this is going to have more. This is a this is a combination of an insane travel journey of Sir Richard Burton <laughs> combined with the. Uh, does anybody remember those beautiful Peterson guide? Oh to yeah. Those? That's going to be the Glorantha Bestiary. We want to have it be something utterly unlike. Uh, a regular gaming best jury book. And I figure having Pete, uh, there was this dueling dialogue between the, uh, you know, there's a, a full fledged description of each of the, 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 the beasts, creatures, or elder races um, presented in this. And uh, that was that's done by, by Pete. And then Sandy. This bit is from the perspective of another scholar pointing out why the yep. first scholar doesn't have any idea what he's talking about. <laughs> Pete's voice is a completely incredulous and increasingly incredulous god learner. <laughs> he's, he's doing like a cook's tour of Glorantha. And he's going, my god, I never believed this was possible. And then it all gets debunked by Sandy's voice. <laughs> well, of course this is nonsense, and here's why he was wrong. Well, I don't even <laughs> think that he ever went to a Mathar. Because <laughs> if he had, he would have noticed. Will there and be the more pages? material? <laughs> well, there will be more paint, but, but, but that's not on the, the immediate <laughs> short term. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, you mean big rubble. Those two books are, mm -hmm. those bo two books are, are, are ready in the pipeline. The next thing that, that brings me in uh, as the author of, and that will be going to a Kickstarter, 
is the gods and mythology of Glorantha book, which is the com basically, as we talked about, the companion to that, and let, that gets us back to Belantar's book. Because that's what Belantar's book was intended to that it was the first draft of by Greg, was to to, because Greg was never ne Greg didn't was not happy with the Avalon Hill, God's going to book, and internally that was viewed as you know this it's just a list it's a list of gods and a list of spells that it, it didn't have much charm, and it didn't really give you much insight into the mythology of Yeah, the uh, the. Hero Quest uh, first edition Lumer source book kind of had the same problem. Exactly. Oh, and I'm on camera, so I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we uh, can do better than ILH one and ILH two. We can do better. You can just take it down, Neil. You can come down. But um, what the guys? Papal guys. Uh, technical question: uh, Is it true that the Masterclass tool is not allowed to use anything that it wheels? What? <laughs> He's not allowed to what? Use anything else on wheels or pay? Or what, what, the, what on earth does that come from? No. I mean, there was, was, I've never heard that theory. No, Mastikos is the, 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 the yeah. Orlanthi God of Movement. Also, the blue planet that races across the sky and never goes into the underworld? I don't know where it comes from. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, sometimes things just just sometimes things just bubble out. Maybe in your camp, that your glorious will there. But but the question concerning timeline, uh, it's come up uh, during several of our campaigns. Like we've been uh, we've been following uh, quite some of the events up to the Hero Wars, uh, and then it's uh, it sort of stops up. Yep. Well, that's going to be the second part of what we talk about. But let me just describe a little bit of what the gods, uh, the, the, the gods and mythology of the book will be. What we take, we're taking Belantar's book as actually the skeleton of this. Because what we want to use is we want to use the much more, we want to have much more expansive explanations of the cults their background, their place in the world, their basic mythological structure, and their core key event within the monomyth, and their key contribution within the monomyth, in order to both explore the, and describe the individual cult, and flesh out the full uh, monomyth of Glorantha. And so this was something that Greg, and Greg did a lot of work on this. So if you've ever seen the Bellantar's book, I, I don't know if you've seen the draft, that, um, only excerpts. Greg and Rob Heinzu um, took the first stab at this way back in 98, and it's something Greg has been tinkering on for, Bellantar's book was 98, wasn't it? Uh, no, because Victoria Con was 97, so it would have been 96. 96, sorry, 96. Because when they took the first stab at it, 90, 96, and Greg had been tinkering along this for a very long time. Million of years. And so what we have, what, what I need to finish before we get to the, the Kickstarter stage is finish out the, the a fleshed out manuscript dealing with the roughly 25 to 30 most significant cults yeah. in Glorantha, arranged not by culture, not by um, alphabetical order, but where they fit in with the, the mythological structure of Glorantha. And, and then we're going to go, once the, the text is ready, we're going to do like we did with the, uh, the Guide to Clarantha, and we will kickstart it and in order to make sure that it you know, can be a full color book with, uh, what, with what we want to have is the right amount of art, etc. But if it's very successful, we will of course be adding cults into that structure to make it a bigger and bigger, bigger, bigger book. So, you know, the, the, the draft that I will be, that, that we'll have ready to go, you know, if the Kickstarter only raises the, the basic amount of money, we'll have very fleshed out descriptions of about 25 to 30 cults. 
but of course if it's very successful, I think that the fan base will be perfectly happy with us doing the same thing we did with the, the guide to Carantha and raising that number up to 50 or even more than that. Uh, and we're very excited about that. So it is going to have a description of cult and worship, not just... Uh, yeah, oh yes, oh yes, okay. oh yes. And it won't have spell lists, it's systems. So what, 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 what it is, is this is looking at these Goranthan cults without reference to rule systems silliness. Well, but no, no, still, I mean, I, I still can't figure out who's allowed to worship what subcult of Yelm. So that would be oh, that we, we, we will be defining it. And this is the problem is, is the very word subcult <laughs> is, it, it's a word that needs to have significantly more definition because it horribly confuses people. Uh, it is, and it horribly confuses people because for whatever reason, in the Hero Wars, Hero Quest one period, uh, people just went way wiggy and crazy about ways of complex and, and made things needlessly complex. And with Yelm, we will have a description of an explanation. Who can worship Yelm? Um, and in Dirahapa, as opposed to Penn, where it's slightly different, Yelm is worshipped in, in by many of the Penn tribes, as is Kargzant. Uh, but we're not going to put it in a games rules manner, but we're going to present it in the style that we did in the guide, which is then rules publishers like law, uh, like law can correctly. take that document and make sure that, that their rule system reflects what's in this core non-games rule document so that the rules allow you to really have the proper feeling of the setting. Yeah, I'm still thinking like a god learner. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and that's an important, but it's important to do this exercise. I mean, if you go back to the original history of, of Colts of Prax and Colts of Terror, that was always one of Greg's um, artistic complaints about those books, is that a lot of those cults were rules exercises. Mm -hmm. And you had the, a lot of those cults didn't actually reflect or detail Greg's background material about how those cults were supposed to work within his fictional world. There's a cult so called balanced as well. Yeah, and, 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 and the, the power getting cults like Umax and Yelmalio, and then the, the ones that didn't get tinkered with in that way that were relatively weak were actually mythically much more important. Well, and again, the gods of Glorantha said there's the big section, again, it's very Gothler thing, the big section on healing goddesses, and which gives the impression that they're all basically the same. There's the big section on rain goddesses, and they're all basically the same. Hunting cults. Oh, that, that, the terrible thing of, of just you know, saying, okay, we're just going to have hunter gods, and that'll be the entry of the gods of, uh, the gods of Glorantha. And so, yeah, 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 you know, Odila and Zong the Hunter, uh, it's pretty much from the same thing, isn't it? God's Cyclopedia. Yeah. You were about to say that. But the, um, you know, one of the things that we're also really wanting to do is a lot more in Glorantham depiction of, of divine images. So instead of showing, you know, here he is, here is, you know, the god flying around, you know, as depicted in a, a normal fantasy book, well, what I will be working with the artists again. A lot of the ones that were involved in the guide will be. This is an Israelian wall painting. I love the artifact style. Art. Yeah, and and it's that's. Great. And, and that's what a lot of the imagery, probably the bulk of the imagery that we'll be doing in the, uh, the, the God's book will be. And you know, obviously, we're not going to start the Kickstarter until we're in a position that if the Kickstarter only raises the bare minimum, then okay, raise the bare minimum, we're ready to go to it, and we'll, we'll get the thing um, published and out. But also we want to have it in a position that if you know, we do have the degree of fan support that we have with the guide. 
that we have it built in place and we have a plan to be able to, to handle that and make everyone really, really excited, really, really happy of finally having the whole corpus of the Ryanthan mythology in one book. And you'll have to push the release date back a year. But. I don't think anybody would complain if... Well, I'm waiting <laughs> patiently for the guy. Yeah, and it'll be out before Christmas. I promise. I promise. My wife will murder everybody on the Moon Design team if, if that. Don't look right at me when you say that. <laughs> my my, I I believe that if the thing isn't ready for Christmas, uh, we will be that all will be found. We will all be Christmas. found with arrows pointing out of it. My wife's an archer. Uh, no, it's 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 it will be done and out. Uh, and. There simply is no way that's not going to happen. But I mean, that is a challenge. In the you know the next one we're going to have, we are going to think a little more carefully about some of the stretch goals about that. But if there's a huge demand for lots of information, and we have a you know we are going to be we're not going to have any stretch goals in this thing that are the equivalent of oh yeah, hey, let's map the entire southern continent to the same degree of detail is the yeah. northern continent. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's add the A styles to it as well. Well, I think the, I mean, Based on 17 pages of notes, we'll make another 100 pages of material. <laughs> I think, yeah. Jeff, you're going to have to go through every, every island gone on the A style. <laughs> <laughs> all all 10,000 or whatever there are. Yeah, 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 all all 10,000 is really mm -hmm. good. <laughs> every single yeah. one. Well, you know, let's see, that would be 10,000 separate stretch goals achieved in roughly, you know, for 5 million, I think I would do that. You've already got a book called Land of 10,000 Goddesses, and it doesn't have 10,000 goddesses in it. That's false advertising. No, 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 it's creative title. I know, I think it refers to there being 10,000 goddesses. I just don't know. <laughs> it's a land of 10,000 guys. But, um, that, you know, those are what's on the event horizon after the guide is out. We've got some other things in that, we're, that you know, we'll be able to announce, oh, certainly. Uh, oh yeah, King of Sartor, it will be uh, King of Sartor, which has been expanded with new material by Greg, with fully and fully annotated, including the actual correct dates of the events that go on the Hero Wars, because Greg, Greg gave wrong, deliberately gave wrong dates for the events of the Hero Wars in King of Sartre. Well, I figured, but... <laughs> With the new version, we'll have annotations saying, well, yeah, I know it says 1755, but most scholars now believe that it was <laughs> blah, 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 King of Sartre is it's presented, it's presented as... Um, there's a lot of, the most uh, so well-known well gods around the version by the end of the world that is, or the goddess that is most version of them all, Wurakiki, with all her... Worshippers, uh, how will she uh, uh, participate in the Hero Wars? Uh, Gorakiki? Yeah. Gorakiki is not a primary, uh, a primary agent of what's going on because, let's face it, she's the goddess of the insects. If the trolls do well with the Hero Wars, Gorakiki will be happy because her children will expand. But I don't think. Unlike, they will unlike the Frag Spider, the Fire Witch, <laughs> much I don't more worshippers than any of the other roles. Yeah, but does she have very many, uh, anywhere near as many uh, initiates into her higher mysteries of the other gods? Because, you know, I don't think very many insects are actually initiated <laughs> into her deep mysteries. They just are. They're just insects. I they're, say, mis I, they're all mystics. They don't get any magic. Yeah, I yeah. Most most centipedes don't get a tremendous amount of magic. I mean, there's a few to do. There's a few to do, but yeah. And actually, I'm not even sure that Gorakiki has the more 
the most worshippers? Wouldn't that be me? Uh, me Virala, the goddess of molds and fungi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, 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 they oh. shoot up everywhere. <laughs> they shoot up everywhere. That's right. Although one could argue. Well, and then there's, isn't, there, uh, isn't there a goddess of algae? So that's a runner, a contender. Yeah, well, Merdraya. 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 She's, she's, she's up there in that list. I and there's some fish gods that what, have a lot what, of worshippers. What is Ralph Clark's view on the Capodemon activities on the demon plateau, actually? What is his views yeah, on so this? Yeah, like attitude towards the Capodemon. What happens to Ralph and Carter? Oh. Well, let's get into the future of the anthem, but I, I, I don't think there's a lot that goes on in Duraster that one way or another Rausakarak doesn't view as something that he's using to his own ends. So he allows the activities of the poor ogres? Why wouldn't he? What, why would Rausakarak have a problem with ogres? Why would Rausakarak have a problem with Rausgard doesn't have a problem with the feral brews, other than the brews are annoying in the way the Trolkin are because they're too stupid to, uh, the, the feral brews are too stupid and too clueless to actually be terribly useful. So periodically he beats them up, uh, you know, has them beaten up, but the feral brews serve a purpose as well. And they'll be all part of the grand uh, the grand master plan of Rausakar. So will the ogres. Be well, I'm sure the ogre, ogres are very useful. Ogres can infiltrate human society. Well, the taka demons are the, uh, the, the or bits of black cloth, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. I, there, I, I, don't think, I don't think there's anything in Duraster that is truly a threat to Rausakar. No. Except for Rausakark himself. <laughs> Rausakark himself is probably Rausakark's biggest threat. Uh, Two-dimensional Rausakark? Could be. There's, there's a lot of Rausakark. Rausakark has a lot of aspects of himself, yeah. but is all a Rausakark. <laughs> because Rausakark's a chaos god, and chaos gods definitely have that degree of, of internal contradiction and paradox. But demon but let, Pazo is the only place that Papa Demon can manifest themselves, himself in the in the plane, in the mundane plane. Oh, what a cacody, where a cacodemon can manifest itself? Yeah. yeah. That, that's the demon. One of the few ghosts that can manifest himself. Well, we man, yeah, well, well, one of the shattered pieces of, of you know, one of the, I mean, cacody, the cacodemon that manifests itself in, in ogre cult rites is not something that you would, cons it, it's a demon. It's it's a part. It's a manifestation of Cacodemon, but it's not a great. It's, it's not a particularly great power. You know, no. it's not like Orlanth manifesting itself. It's a. It's a. a but Orlanth can't manifest himself on the mundane, mundane plane. Well, in the sen in that sort of sense, Orlanth or does manifest himself constantly. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, he's, well, he's the world he's, 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 yeah, he's, he's the manifesting world's. to directly participate okay. in this. No, no, because and even, and even yeah. then, I mean, every most Orlanthian rituals involve um, part, part opening a gateway to the gods' realm. So, Orlanth is kind of manifesting as that. Yeah, nice. sure enough, uh, <laughs> but. But, 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 before going down that one, I also wanted to, to talk a little bit about the future because I don't know how much time we have here. Uh, we have about 20 minutes. About 20 minutes. We, we talk about the future of Glorantha from a Glorantha uh, uh, perspective because there's a lot in the guide, as, as David has just been <laughs> rediscovering, uh, that deals with the events of the Hero Wars after 1621, after 1624. And there's a huge amount of material on that in, in the guide. One of the things I wanted to was, was mention is if you do a, we've been working out um, with uh, David Scott and I, because David's been working on a lot of Praxian material. Uh, and one of the things is, is that going on, for instance, you have a game in Prax, 
and the traditional time frame for practicing campaigns is roughly 1615, which is the beginning of when the old RQG Borderlands was set, to 1621, which is the um, uh, cradle scenario in the Big Rubble book. That's traditionally the arc of what goes on. In a number of things that, that, that going on that um, really needed to need to be seeded in new material. That's seeded in you get the hints of it in the Pavis book, but Pavis isn't really the center of what's going on. But a, I believe it's 1617. Uh, Argrath uh, returns from the underworld with the white bull. Which Argrath? Which there yeah, is one Argrath. Which of them? The white. Is that one Argrath? There's one primary Argrath. Though that he has a lot of companions, a lot of, and other associates that sometimes get confused with Argrath. Just Argrath. like Arcat had his companions that were often, their actions were attributed to Arcat. But there was one primary Arcat. Okay. There is one primary, there is one guy who kills lunar tax uh, collectors in Colimar land, is exiled, go, yeah. go, or is outlawed, flees into Prax, is captured by the Bison Riders, goes into the wastes, uh, and uh, finds the White Bull Spirit, and brings the White Bull Spirit back, comes back to Pavis, uh, performs the Drinking Giant's Cauldron Quest, uh, in order which allows him to make a pact with the Giants which causes the cradle to come down, which Argrath then protects. Argrath rides in the cradle, meets Herrick. They sail around the world and interact with more cultures and more mythologies and more different mythic perspectives on the world than any human being since the God Learners era. Keep this in mind that Argrath has hero quested in more different perspectives on the world than any human being uh, alive. Uh, by the time he shows up with Herrick in the Holy Country, they fight, he and Herrick allied with Broyan at the Battle of Pennell, uh, defeat the Lunars there. Argrath then returns to Prax in 1624, rallies the White Bull, uh, society and the other tribes seizes Pavis with the aid of other figures, including another guy who coincidentally is named Argrath. <laughs> uh, but that he played Argrath and Pavis plays a pretty small role. You know, he's very involved in the, the immediate liberation of Argra of Pavis. But the primary Argrath figure is the guy who has the gigantic army of Praxians. They march on the Lunar Temple in 1625, get beat by Tatius, and are forced to go back into Prax to get a bigger barbarian army, at which point the Dragon Rise happens. The bigger ar bigger barbarian, uh, bigger Praxian army comes into Dragon Pass. Uh, Kalar has already made herself Prince of Sartar, although Argrath has as good of a claim on the throne as she does. Uh, I believe he goes down into the <coughs> holy country um, and up to uh, Aldatura as well in 1625, 1626. I'd have to look at the notes on this. Uh, when Calor is killed at the Battle of the Queens, Argrath becomes Prince of Sartar marches into Tarsh, and uh, by now the Lunars have concluded he is a big, serious, major threat, and has brought their main army, the main Imperial army down, led by Jarion. And there's the Battle of the Heroes in 1628, which Argrath, where Argrath and Herrick decisively defeat uh, Jarion. And uh, I believe after that, uh, Argrath begins the, the wooing of the Feathered Horse Queen. I mean, in all of that, there's other figures involved, but it's one primary figure. Okay, that's um, that's kind of different from the common fan theory. Yeah, and the issue was is that Greg played around with the idea that well, maybe I'm going to try this 
write this as multiple figures. Now all of his older material that he wrote, and everything that he did before is it's one primary figure. And the fact was, is thematically and narratively, the multiple R graphs didn't really work in a compelling manner. Didn't make, it didn't really make a tremendous, and, I, and again, I'm speaking from an artistic perspective because also what's really important is that this is good, riveting story. And so what you have is this guy who is one of the most, if not the most accomplished, diverse hero quester who's phenomenally good it being able to not just deal with the Orlanthe mythological perspective of it, but he's used to seeing the world from an outsider's perspective for, from wherever he is, and it allows him to make connections that are mythologically true, they, they, they work within the, 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 the structure of Glorantha, but they're not any that any culture is making, and it makes him extraordinarily uh, dangerous for the Lunar Empire, especially after 1628. Jario was, uh, Jari was killed by Herod, but gets better. Because <laughs> well, she lightly. was lightly killed. She's only mostly no, dead. Only I think she has to spend a little time for, uh, wandering through the underworld to resurrect herself. But she's Jario. I mean, yeah. these things happen. And uh, why? It, the emperor's, the defeat of the Lunar Empire is the last straw. Red Emperor gets sacrificed by Great Sister. And so that's also part of the issue for Argrath, is Argrath gets, what, about a five, six year period where there effectively is no Lunar Empire. And, but by that point, then we're right into the classic White Bear Red Moon war game of these powerful entities just throwing everything they can against each other. And then our, um, then Jari's son ends up on the throne and uh, winds up taking back the dragon pass. Yep, yep, yep. And so there's, and, and we've also really tried to make sure that, that it's clear in the guide. And if you read carefully through the, um, the Secrets of the Hero Wars section, a lot of what I just said is right there. And also that there is one primary Argrath is explained um, in that. That brings me to my next question. <laughs> hey, a, a while back, I think it was quite a while back, I remember hearing something about the possibility of a book called The Great Argrath Campaign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Greg wrote um, a, a preliminary treatment of that. A lot of that, but there wasn't, he didn't put in scenarios, but he established the internal timeline of events and how, how all of that fits together. A lot of that then ended up become, getting used as the base for the Secrets of the Hero Wars section. And I am not going to make any promises on any specific books, but I would certainly would love to do a year by year uh, Arthur Pendrick and style uh, Argrath or hero or just the Hero Wars campaign book, and that would Greg what Greg did do on that would form the the structural outline. Jeff Forrest, guys, here. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Nice to meet you. See you. Uh, I'll be seeing you tomorrow. I'll be seeing you tomorrow. Sure. But uh, Greg did not finish that. And it's not in a place where I could just like with, unlike with Bellantar's book, where I, you know, can fairly easily see how I can finish up the book. Uh, the Grand Arcgrass Saga is a structural outline that's really useful for me to be able to know how the Hero Wars progresses, but it's it will require an, a, a very large amount of writing for me to complete it. And that's not to say that I'm not gonna do that, but I'm going to see, you know, we wanna see what the reception is on the, the God's Garantha book. We wanna, you know, one of the things I don't want us to be doing is, is what was the uh, section that you used to have in the MIG? What never was. What never was. I don't wanna be announcing vaporware. 
And I've got some books that I've said that we will do, including uh, a big rubble book that does the, uh, where we rewrite the cradle scenario uh, so that it's actually playable. And also does the drinking giant's cauldron material and deals more with white bull and gives you much, much, much more detail about each of the regions of the big rubble. We promise that we will do that. I want to get that done. I've also promised that there will be a, a, uh, a campaign that's basically the uh, King Brian story arc. Mm. And that's another thing I want to get done before I try to do another huge mega project that pushes everything off uh, the sideline for a lengthy period of time. Because it's really important to us that we don't, you know, say, well, yeah, we're going to do this, this book and never get around to doing it. Still so, um, to do list. <laughs> does that mean, will, will we ever get a, um, will we ever get a real Lunar Source book? I badly, well, beyond what's in the guide, yes, of course we will. Uh, who will write it? That's an open question. I mean, I would have, in an ideal world, there would be a Lunar Source book written by Nick Brook and, and Chris Goodlow. But both of those guys are not as young and flexible with their time as they were. And so it would be something, it would have to be something where I would have to hire somebody to do a bulk of the writing. Because also, one of the things that internally I'm going to be doing is once the guide is out, the God's book is out, and these core canonical books are done, I'm going to be much happier having uh, other writers work within the confines of this and then do what Greg did with a lot of the early Chiazzi material, then come in and insert additional material after I added it. And that's probably what would be done with a Lunar Source book. So what we did with Coming Storm, uh, Ian Cooper's book. That's what we have to do with Herrick Saga as well. It's rich. It, it, I, it's, I, I've written so much had to stop because we had to finish, or Jeff had to finish the guide, and then... And so, Lars would ask me questions, and it'd be like, well, I don't know the answer to it because I'm, you know, I'm not finished with that section yet. And, and that was another thing about the... The, the key thing with Powell Teller, which had never been detailed, I got as far as Powell Teller and couldn't take it any further because we didn't know what was there. Hmm. So, because the guide wasn't finished. And this, this was something that... that um, really, in structuring what our future releases are going to be, are going to be is I don't want to have these sorts of log jams where I have a foundational working on a foundational text that means that other books that people would like to have done can't get done until I finish the foundational text. So I want to get the foundational text clear and out of the way before we do we we do material that's riffs off the foundational text. Because it, it just would be stupid to, to you know, have a book and then come in and have, you know, Greg won't Greg anything ever again. That's 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 in our contract. <laughs> but I don't want to be, I don't want that the, the term Greg just to get replaced with Jeff. Jeff. <laughs> no, 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 it's moved. Or moved. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's another issue is, is in talking about canon, uh, we, I'm very committed to there being consistency within the Moon Design product line, and that the Moon Design product line is canonical publications of Glorantha, and that if I write something in the guide to Glorantha, I'm not going to contradict that without a damn good reason, like, I misspelled it, or, uh, but what's in there is good to go. I mean, I'm, there's not going to be significant changes to any details on that. Uh, the only foreseeable things I could imagine is going, I can't believe I wrote that and what didn't get through the, the months of laborious copy editing. <laughs> Martin Scott, we're also embarrassed that we want to commit seppuku because <laughs> oh, we can't believe that got through. That I can imagine, <laughs> Jeff, you know, something like that. But you know, 
if it's in the guide, we're sticking to it. One last question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is this the last question, or is this the last, last question? This is the last, last, last question. OK. Um, unless anyone else wants to ask one. Uh, but um, can, you, uh, can, can, you, can you give us a list of, currently, the gods who are going to be in Gods of Glorantha? The, the preliminaries. I can't, the preliminaries. Give you the I can't give you the final list because I don't know the final list. Yeah. Depends That's on the stretch goals. <laughs> well, there's the stretch goals. <laughs> but but you, you, you mean the core gods that will be in yeah, that? The current, the, what, what the current draft yeah. or whatever. Okay. Well, I think you guys mentioned them earlier when you were debating who had the most worshippers. It'll be exactly by number yeah, of worshippers. Yeah, I mean, these are all like And Kyger Lighter will be listed twice. Yeah. <laughs> No, it'll be, uh, what we're looking at is in, in the core bit, um, Aldraya, Mosto, Arnalda, Yelm, Malkion, Kumak, Dorlanth, Kygerlider, Zaraxaran, Yamalio, uh, Unholy Trio, Stormbull, uh, the other seven Lightbringers, Colts, uh, Hrustal, Nizalor, Arkhat, Harmast, um, the modern schools of Malkioni Sorcery, uh, Seven Mothers, Red Goddess, Warren, Dolphipa, and Haneo. Um, and then probably another five to ten on top of that. Okay. So, you know, a lot of player character. Uh, yes, it's going to be heavy on Colts that player, uh, that people that want to play in Glorantha are going to be playing. But it's also good. If stretch goals, at the top of the list of stretch goals is Pamela, which I'm pretty sure will end up in it. But, I, again, I mean, it's... If we're going to be going in and, and and preparing a document that can go, if we just reach the the, um, the funding level, it's going to be Gennertella uh, heavy because that's the the easiest thing to put together that we know that that I can do in a, a easily determined schedule. Yeah, but I'd like to see more about the Fonridian gods. Uh, well, if we go down here, we've got uh, Daruda, Godonia, Cable, Waha, Raitha, Ampalan, Sassin, uh, Gark the Calm, uh, you know, the, Ger uh, the Glorious Ones. Those would all be stretch goals onto it. Okay. So, because they are more work. They are more work to, to, to put together and... Well, there's, you have to do new, more new material. You can't just... Well, re Greg just hasn't stuff. written much on them or saying... Yeah, and the, the issue is, is, is that, that one of the things that I think is important if you're going to do, we're get, you're going to do a Kickstarter book is you have to have something that's ready to go. Um, I don't like the idea of saying, hey, I got this crazy idea. If you guys give me enough money, uh, this is the crazy idea that I'll do. Uh, I prefer the approach that we took in the guide, which is we've got something ready to go, but we, we're going to need some money to make it more awesome. Uh, but it's ready to, you know, something you like and something that's a good book, it's ready to go. Well, here's, uh, here's hoping the next Kickstarter is successful as the last one. I, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. It, but I think that that's a, also an important thing in managing. Uh, yeah, sorry.